Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming, guys. Uh, today's speaker is a uh, Dr. Men Bin or Ben Ye, as he's known. Um, before we start, uh, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we are meeting on the land of Wurundjeri people uh, of Kulam Nation, and uh, we pay respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. And welcome to the talk. Um, he is uh, uh, giving a talk about this uh, collective behavior in complex social networks, experiments, modeling, and analysis. He's a kind of rare breed of engineer who does uh, human experimentation and collecting data, as well as modeling of the uh, and simulation of the uh, human behaviors. Um, the first time I encountered him was uh, in writing. Um, he uh, somebody gave me a paper on the. Um, um, a Friedkin and Jon Johnson's a, a a classic paper it was an extension of that, a multi-dimensional extension on, on that, on the um, um, opinion dynamics in and the uh, uh, social influence processes in social networks, and the um, um, and since then I began to discover many of the uh, um, uh, wonderful uh, writings and the achievements he's made uh, and the contributions made to the field. Um, he received his uh, engineering degree at Auckland in New Zealand and the, uh, came across the ditch to the ANU and completed his PhD in 2018 and uh, received a Crawford Prize for his uh, PhD uh, contribution and spent a year, was it, in Groningen in the Netherlands as a postdoc, returned to Curtin uh, as a lecturer, and currently he is a senior lecturer, and the uh, on a fellowship, I, I understand, on this kind of processes. So please welcome Dr. Ben Membin Ye. Okay, so um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, let me thank Andy and Yoshi for um, inviting me to visit and um, arranging me to stay for about a week and a half. So uh, yeah, thank you. What I'm going to talk about today is really uh, a body of work that's taken about four years to put together, and it's still really ongoing. So there's a lot of um, future work that we're planning and hoping uh, to do. What I want to do today uh, in terms of a seminar is to introduce to you uh, a model, a game theoretic model of collective behavior. Uh, in particular, I'm uh, going to apply it mostly to the process of social diffusion. Then I'm going to talk about the types of um, experiments we ran in order to validate and then refine uh, this particular model. I'll talk about the different strategies we use to explore how to facilitate the emergence of uh, collective behavior, namely social diffusion. Um, and then lastly, talk about an extension where we modeled uh, the co-evolution of behavior and opinions. Um, today, it's going to be quite an overview talk, so I won't be able to get into too many technical details. Uh, if you're interested, there's um, four papers that the work is really, or this presentation is uh, built on, two papers that recently appeared, and then two that are under review. If you're interested, um, I'm happy to share them with you. And of course, I'm here for a, a week and a bit, so uh, there'll be lots of opportunity, I think, to actually discuss in person about my work. Uh, I want to also thank the people that actually worked on this with me. Um, there's been a really big team. And in particular, I want to point out uh, Lorenzo, who's in a sense my partner in crime, uh, and pretty much everything we've done, we've done um, together collectively. Uh, Ming was my postdoc supervisor who put me on, uh, you know, started me on this journey of um, modeling collective behavior. Jan Willem, Hans, Bob, and Jean, they're psychologists from the marketing and um, economics group in uh, Groningen. Hassan was a, a, is now a graduated PhD student, and Roy is currently completing his PhD at Curtin. Okay, so my talk is split up into four parts. I'm going to give you some uh, problem and background context and then talk about the, the classical or the fundamental model that we're using. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, my research uh, divided into, into three parts. So to begin with, let's think about what collective behavior or is, uh, is or at least how I view collective behavior. Uh, and there are many different types. So it can range from what we see in nature in terms of ants teaming up to cross a particular obstacle um, to the emergence, sometimes spontaneously, of social movements and protests in human society. There are some common characteristics, um, whether we are thinking about ants or people, 
And uh, these include the fact that we'll, we've got a large population of what I'll call agents. Um, and they often self-organize and they coordinate amongst themselves. Uh, leadership, if it does emerge, is very much often local um, and collective behavior can happen without the presence of any global uh, leader dictating uh, what to do. And through repeated uh, agent interactions, whether they're ant-to-ant -ant interactions or human-to-human -human interactions, uh, there will emerge group intelligence and uh, capabilities that far exceed any particular individual agent. So these are things to keep in mind as we explore the types of models that I'll um, present today. Now, here's another type of collective behavior that we all experienced uh, over the last two to three years um, in the pandemic. Um, we, in a sense, saw the emergence of a new way to greet each other, a new social convention to elbow bump. And then, at least for me, it's more or less disappeared. I mean, this morning I uh, shook Yoshi's hand, so we're, we're back to handshakes handshakes now. And so to me, it's a, an example of collective behavior that's emerged and then disappeared um, within the span of two to three years. All right. I'm interested in collective behavior in humans. And in particular, that means uh, typically people have to make decisions about what to do, what to adopt, uh, what behavior to follow. And it's important because when we look at mathematical modeling, we need to appreciate the fact that uh, there are significant differences in the processes between, uh, for instance, whether we explicitly decide to stick out a hand, uh, to shake hands, or to lead with our elbow. And that's very different, uh, for instance, to trying to model the process of being infected by um, a, a disease like COVID-19. So the point here is, although, uh, for instance, there are epidemic models that capture the diffusion of contagion through a population, uh, I'm going to say, well, in some instances, they're not appropriate for capturing collective behavior and decision making because people make strategic choices about what to do. And that's uh, quite different to infectious disease spread. What I'm going to focus on are social influence and coordination as central uh, tenants to collective behavior. Social diffusion is the main thing I'm going to be focusing on. And here we uh, assume that there's an innovation which might be a behavior, an idea, a technological product, something that spreads across a population to eventually replace the status quo. The innovation might not be chronologically novel or uh, technologically novel. It's really to refer to something that's appeared in the population for the first time. It's a collective phenomenon that's driven by individual interactions and decisions on whether or not to adopt the innovation um, over the status quo. Uh, so, okay, so the, the, so if I understand the question is, um, is it uh, to replace a status quo or to reinforce it? Um, in my particular context, it's to replace it. So what I would have is a status quo behavior, let's say shaking hands. And then what I'm interested in is whether, let's say elbow bumping can replace um, handshakes as the uh, accept, uh, accepted behavior in that population. So there might be another context or model for reinforcement. And uh, I guess it's it's no surprise that I'm interested here because it's one of the sort of core um, features that allows a society to grow, um, to change and to improve over time. So here's a very classical example of um, innovation diffusion which is the spread of new hybrid seed corn in Iowa farming communities in um, the mid to late uh, 30s. And on the left-hand side is a typical what we call diffusion curve or S-curve. Um, the the x-axis is the time since the corn was introduced into the farming communities, and the y-axis is the percentage of farmers adopting the new corn. So there's a couple of features that are sort of um, common among all diffusion processes. There's a delay. So in this case, it was uh, over a decade before farmers actually adopted the corn or started to adopt it um, from when it was first introduced. Then there's what we call a tipping point or a, a takeoff in the diffusion process. And then there's a transition, uh, which in this case is about eight years uh, from no adoption to almost 100% of all farmers adopting the corn. Uh, 
these things can vary between uh, different examples. So there might be short delays or long delays. Um, there might be a very short and explosive transition, or it might be smooth and gradual. But nonetheless, the fusion processes typically have these three uh, features. Driving forces include the presence of a commit committed minority, so people that are absolutely bent on um, proving that this innovation is going to take over. So maybe no matter what you do with your uh, grading, I'm just going to leave with my elbow. I don't care whether you stick out your hand or not. Um, on the other hand, the innovation might be superior in some way. So uh, here the hybrid seed corn provided better crop yield, so there's a monetary incentive to adopt. And of course, um, laws and authorities can be, um, or sorry, public authorities can implement laws in order to force uh, adoption of innovation. So one example might be new laws that are coming in for electric vehicles. Um, I'm going to really focus on the first two aspects uh, throughout this talk. So let me talk a bit about the uh, classic game theoretic model that is uh, sometimes used to model diffusion. We've got a population of, uh, a population of uh, strategic decision-making agents um, who are captured in a set V and they interact over a network. I'm labeling them arbitrarily uh, as agents one, two, through to N. So N is the size of this uh, network population I'm considering. And at discrete time instance T uh, from zero, one, two, all the way through to infinity, um, an arbitrary agent I in the population can select between two alternative strategies. And I'm going to denote the strategy of agent I as X sub, uh, sub I at time T. And there are two possible choices, uh, zero or one. And for convenience, I'm going to also sometimes use blue uh, to label the strategy zero and red to label the strategy one. This particular model is built on coordination games on networks. So the idea here is you have payoff functions for the agent um, to select strategy one and to select strategy zero. Uh, and okay, so I needed this figure. And the uh, idea here is that um, if you're looking, or if you're coming at it from the perspective of agent I, what you're trying to do is play a coordination game with each of your network neighbors. So these are the five neighbors of agent I, and uh, agent I is trying to coordinate strategies with all five of them. The payoff for um, selecting strategy one for agent I is simply the number of neighbors picking strategy one. Uh, multiplied by a coefficient one plus alpha, and I'll get to this in a second. Um, the strategy, or the, sorry, the payoff for selecting strategy zero is simply the number of neighbors that are picking strategy zero. And alpha is what we call the relative advantage of uh, red over blue. If alpha is zero, the two strategies are uh, payoff equivalent. And if alpha is negative, uh, blue has a payoff advantage over red. And if alpha is positive, it has uh, red has a payoff advantage over blue. And for the purposes of this talk, and just to keep things consistent, I'm going to assume that um, the innovation is uh, one and the status quo is zero. Okay, so we're then going to say, well, agents have payoffs. What they want to do is uh, maximize their immediate payoff, their rational agents trying to select um, uh, a strategic choice they're not going to look into their past history or uh, try to predict the future. All they're going to do is maximize what they see in front of them. And so that's um, sometimes called myopic best response. It means that they're going to select strategy one at the next time step. If the payoff for strategy one is higher, they'll select strategy zero if the payoff for strategy zero is higher. I've uh, inserted the tie break here in case the strategies are equal. Sometimes you might say, well, people aren't really rational. They're not going to be perfectly um, uh, selecting the higher payoff strategy at any point in time. And you can capture this by um, something called log linear learning. And this represents the idea of bounded rationality where the probability of picking um, a particular strategy at the next time step is given by this expression. You can see that the payoff functions appear and beta is a parameter that captures uh, the individual's rationality. So when beta is zero, it's a coin toss as to what they choose. And then as beta tends towards infinity, they approach perfect rationality. Um, you can think of it as on the x-axis here, if, um, if this is the difference in payoff between strategy one and strategy zero, then as beta gets larger and larger, you have a high and higher probability of picking uh, the better payoff strategy. 
So that's a lot of um, talking. And now here's some pretty pictures. Here's a simulation of run on just an arbitrary synthetic network I generated. I've randomly initialized their strategy. And um, this is what it would look like. So on the left-hand side, um, we see that uh, very quickly, the strategies sort of, or the population split into clusters. And this happens when the strategies have no payoff advantage over one another. So you see very strong local conformity, but very, or you get diverse clusters across the network. On the right-hand side, what you see is that when there's a very small um, payoff advantage and when agents have a very uh, high rationality, but not perfect rationality, the red strategy very slowly spreads um, across and becomes dominant. So here we don't see social diffusion, we see sort of clustering and uh, polarization. And on the right-hand side, um, there is a diffusion of the red strategy across the population. Okay, so that is really what's been done over the last two to three decades, um, more or less. And what I'm going to talk about now is the, the things that I've worked on since. Um, I guess to begin with, we really asked, well, can we get some data to validate whether or not this model is actually, um, you know, whether it's useful? Um, it's maybe intuitively quite reasonable, but what can we actually um, say based on data? So with my um, psychology uh, colleagues in Groningen, we uh, set up a multi-round group game. We recruited between 12 to 16 players uh, from pro prolific academics. So this was all done online in the era of COVID. And we asked them to play um, games where they could select uh, between two alternatives repeatedly over um, several time instants. Uh, we asked them to imagine that they were um, on, the uh, on the board of a particular company that had to launch two alternative products to make money, eat or a towel. And at the end of each round, um, players could see the fraction of uh, the rest of the group that were selecting uh, each particular product. So this is uh, a screenshot of what the players saw in the game. And then they could revise their choice. So this is in round uh, round five. And then in the next round, I might revise my choice um, depending on this type of information. And the game stops once a full consensus, all the players have reached the same strategy. Um, it's equivalent to the company successfully voting on which product to launch and everyone gets paid. Um, or after 24 rounds, if there's been no consensus, if there's still a sort of deadlock, then no one gets paid um, because the product failed to launch. So there's a pressure to conform with uh, the strategy because you get paid uh, more money. And what we did was uh, we allowed the human players to initially reach uh, a status quo consensus. This happened within about one to two, sometimes three rounds of the game starting. So it was very fast. And so, for instance, um, in a particular trial, maybe all the human players selected ETA. What we then did was um, just before there was a full consensus on ETA, we introduced some committed minority bots. Sometimes they're called confederates um, in, the, in different literature. And they would specifically vote for Tau to try and overturn the established uh, status quo. And they would continue to vote for Tau no matter what was going on. So the players had, I mean, two choices. One is to switch over to the minor, uh, minority, which is Tau, um, and get paid, or they could try to stick with their um, status quo and eventually they would not get paid. Of course, they didn't know there were bots, but um, I guess that was the two options that would emerge. So we uh, ran about 20 group trials with 180 participants. We sometimes would vary the number of committed minority bots to see whether or not uh, more or fewer bots would have an effect. And here's uh, an example of three trials from the, simulate, uh, from the experiment. So the round numbers are on the uh, x-axis and the fraction of those adopting the minority strategy are on the uh, y. In about half the trials, we observed an almost immediate diffusion. So uh, this is the black line here. So very, very rapidly, the human players said, okay, let's just vote for um, Tau and uh, everyone got paid. In some trials, we saw uh, quite a long delay, a non-trivial um, delay. Uh, so this is the red line. And in this case, it was on the 12th round, then there was a sort of tipping point and everyone very rapidly um, switched over to the minority. You could see there was a sort of attempt at here, but then 
um, it's failed and they kind of switched back. This happened in, I think, four or five of the 20 trials. And then finally, there were trials where um, they failed to reach a consensus. They got close uh, in some cases, and then they went back down. Um, and in this case, they never really took off at all. Yeah, so it's um, it's incentivized. Okay, so so the question was, um, is the incentive uh, each round of the game or in the final round? It's a bit of both. So they only get paid in the final round. But what happens is um, the more you vote for the final strategy that wins, the more you get paid. So you had a sort of incentive to beat everyone else to what you thought was the winning strategy, but sometimes that could be Tau or sometimes that could be Eater. And so there was a bit of, um, I guess, strategy involved in, in how to approach the game. Um, and uh, we conducted some in-person trials with some slight adjustments to the setup. If I have time, I'll talk about it uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation. But that was the, the group level uh, data that we observed, so the diffusion curve, so to speak. We wanted to get a better understanding of what the individual level dynamics look like. And so the first thing we did was to look at how the agents switched strategies or how often they switch strategies. Um, because the, each player might play different game lengths. So if the game finished very early, it was five rounds. If it was 24 rounds, then um, what we did was to normalize the number of times an individual played or changed strategy relative to the length of their game. And so here is the uh, fraction of times uh, over the entire length of the game that um, uh, individuals change strategy. You can see it's very heterogeneous um, in terms of the playing style. And what we did was sort of classify them into two uh, categories of uh, players. People that we called explorers, they were much more likely to join the committed minority um, from the get-go. But at the same time, they also often flip-flopped between Eater and Tau, just trying to make something happen, really. Um, and for instance, this person here would be an explorer. They change strategy almost 50% of the time that they're in the game. Then there are non-explorers that were very, very conservative, and they switch strategies only once or twice, um, and typically really just at the end in order to reach a consensus and get paid. And so most of the uh, non-explorers would be hidden or sorry, not hidden, but contained in this large peak where um, almost 100 players only really switched strategies 5% of the time that they were playing in the game. Besides that, we also uh, conducted some statistical analysis to try and identify what particular variables could predict um, the decisions of an individual in any given round. And so we found three particular variables uh, that would uh, uh, do so. The first is coordination, and that's exactly the what I talked about um, in the introduction. People tended to copy the majority strategy from the previous round, but we also found that um, there was what I'll call inertia, but uh, in some uh, literature they call it status quo bias. It's the idea that without really a particular reason, you're just going to stick with what you did in the last round. And then there was also uh, something called, well, I call uh, trend seeking, but it's the idea that if you sort of notice a trend in a direction of voting, uh, whether or not it's going to become the majority, you're going to try and jump onto the train, so to speak, and um, beat. Yeah. Sorry, how is that different from coordination? So in this case, um, in coordination, it's what happens in the previous round. So whatever's the majority, you're going to um, uh, uh, follow. But in trend seeking, you could have noticed that Tau uh, went from 5% of the share to 10%. And so there's a positive trend, but it's still a minority. And um, you're still going to try and jump on it because maybe you think, okay, there's going to be change. I better get ahead of things. So what we did was uh, take these three mechanisms and modify the payoff function. Um, so conveniently, game theory allows you to incorporate different let's say, psychological mechanisms within the same payoff function and still retain the whole concept of rationality or bounded rational decision-making. To make things easier and to really focus on the effects of these um, two new 
mechanisms of inertia and trend seeking, we just assumed an all-to-all -all network. Later on, I'll uh, actually talk about how we relax this. But the power function for the two strategies, um, so the status quo and the innovation, uh, is given by uh, this equation here. Don't worry too much about the specifics of the expressions, but here, let me just point out that the first term is the coordination uh, game. So exactly what I talked about in the introduction. Uh, we've just assumed that the two strategies are equal. So alpha is zero because in the, in the experiments, there's no reward for selecting one over the other. The second term here captures inertia. So individuals get a higher payoff for sticking with their um, strategy from uh, the current time. And the last term is a little bit um, complex, but what it captures is a higher payoff for those that um, adopt the strategy that's increasing in popularity, regardless of whether it's a minority or majority strategy at that time. So here's the model with the payoff and the log linear learning um, or bounded rational dynamics. And there are four parameters that I want to uh, point out. So BI, KI, and RI are positive coefficients that effectively tell you how much this agent uh, values coordination over inertia, over trend-seeking. So the larger B is, then the more they value um, coordination with respect to these other payoff terms. And beta, of course, is this rationality parameter. So what we did was um, use the experimental data to estimate these four parameters. And um, because there was such a heterogeneous playing style, we had to estimate uh, players with two different um, approaches. So Somewhat surprisingly, we found explorers and non-explorers um, ended up with the same rationality parameter. Um, coordination also more or less the same. And the big difference here was that explorers were far more sensitive to trends. Um, they didn't have much inertia, whereas ex uh, non-explorers were very heavily um, uh, entrenched in, uh, uh, or they wanted to stick with the current strategy and they didn't really care for the trend. So now that we've got a parameterized and I guess modified um, model of diffusion, here's what a simulation would look like. We've got mostly uh, agents that have selected the status quo. And I've got five diamonds who are the, um, the committed minority that are always going to be selecting the red strategy no matter what. And... Okay, so here's the, the simulation um, of uh, of the model. And just to point out, because of the log linear learning dynamics, um, there's always a probability that the all red strategy occurs in the simulation as long as you run it for an infinite amount of time. But the question, of course, is how long um, before you're likely to observe this event? And so that's really what um, we're looking for here. And so you can see for a long time, there's a delay where nothing really is happening. There's a tipping point and then a very rapid um, explosive diffusion towards the all red strategy. So that's in a sense what we saw in uh, some of the uh, experimental trials. And I would say you know, this S curve is uh, somewhat similar to let's say the hybrid seed curve that um, I presented right at the start. Of course, this is uh, much sharper. And I guess there are quite a few uh, key findings, but the one that I want to focus on today is um, as follows. So first I wanna point out that diffusion was always explosive um, or very fast, independent of other factors because of a trend seeking term in the model. And what we found were uh, thresholds for diffuse, diffusion behavior at 25 and 19% of the committed minority. So I'll explain a bit what I mean by that uh, with this heat map. So, on the x-axis, we've got uh, the percentage of the population, of the agent population that are committed minority from 15% to 30%. And uh, on the y-axis, I've got uh, the fraction of the non-committed minority uh, population who are explorers. So from zero explorers to 100% explorers. And here is a heat map of the time it takes to reach the tipping point uh, right before diffusion occurs. When you're above 25% committed minority, um, no matter what the agent population looks like, you're always going to witness diffusion within a reasonable simulation time. When you're below 
um, you'll never witness diffusion in any reasonable simulation time window. In fact, the uh, the time it takes to reach the tipping point grows exponentially with the number of uh, agents in the population. So for large populations, you'll never actually be able to um, simulate diffusion. And then between 19 and 25%, whether or not you are likely to see diffusion uh, depends on how many explorers you have. The more explorers you have, the fewer committed minority you need in order to um, observe diffusion in the simulation. Um, so I guess an interesting thing to point out is that there was also some experimental um, uh, studies done on tipping points and social convention change, and they also identified a value of 25%. Um, in my opinion, it's, to be honest, a bit of a co um, coincidence. I don't think there's any real um, meaning, or at least there's probably um, a lot of context behind these numbers that you, ne you need to pull apart. Um, but the point here is that there is a a threshold of committed minority, which allows you to hit a tipping point. Yeah. Is it like for all and all, then everybody is committed, or, or can yeah. see Yeah. So the question was, uh, are these values for all to all networks? Yes, it is. And then in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about what happens when there's a network structure um, involved. And so this decreases significantly. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, that was uh, the first part of the work that we did. And now we're going to focus more on how we might um, promote or enhance our uh, chances of seeing diffusion. So uh, I talked about how many committed minority we might need um, to see diffusion in a reasonable time window, but there are also other factors that can be at play. So um, network topology structure, as uh, I just pointed out, that's all the simulations in the previous slide was all to all networks. And now we can ask the question, what if there is an interaction structure that constrains the um, way agents interact? And if there is such an interaction structure, well, where can we place the committed minority in order to maximize, um, let's say their impact or their effect? The relative advantage of the innovation was also uh, unstudied. In the previous parameterization, we assumed both strategies were equal. But now let's imagine that the red, tra red strategy could be better. And of course, uh, there's this, I guess, sensitivity to trends, which I'm quite interested in exploring. More recently, there's been a body of literature called dynamic norms that's um, emerging, whereby they're trying to use nudge, uh, nudges by uh, making trends more prevalent to people and then seeing whether that influences their um, choice. So first, let me talk a bit about the network structure. Um, what we did was to embed the agent interactions on different types of synthetic network structures. We picked synthetic ones because um, they were, or we were better able to control certain properties that we wanted to study. So there's a few different sort of classic classes of uh, network structures that we looked at. Um, erdos rainey random networks, the barabasi albert scale-free model, um, what Strogat's uh, model for small world uh, interactions and random regular networks. Again, because of the time constraint, I won't go into the details, but the main thing here is that they've got a few different parameters that allow you to, for instance, uh, vary the average degree of the networks um, that you're able to generate synthetically. What we did was then to look at how likely diffusion was to occur within a simulation um, over 100 independent runs. And if simulation did occur, how fast um, was it? Was it very explosive, like in the previous um, slide slides, or was it very slow and gradual? Uh, let me just summarize, I guess, the key findings here without um, going into uh, the nitty gritty. On the left-hand side is a plot of the effect of average degree. So this here is a plot of different random regular networks um, with different average degrees for the agent. So here, each agent has an average four connections, um, eight connections, 12 connections, and 100 connections. Uh, this is the fraction of committed minority within the population and the percentage of independent simulation runs in which we observed successful diffusion. Um, if you look, for instance, at the red line, what that says is when the committed minority cross a particular threshold, again, so the same as what I've talked about before, 
there was a very rapid change from no uh, successful diffusions in the simulation runs to 100%. And this threshold decreased as the um, average degree decreased. So here the conclusion is that um, the lower average degree or the sparse of the network, the more likely it was to observe diffusion. Oh, it's Rosie. Sorry, it's the it's yes. the um, it's the uh, fraction of the population that are committed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and on the right is um, a plot of different network classes with the same average degree, except for the auto or case where um, the average degree is just the number of agents. Um, so again, here the Watt Strogart small world network. Um, in a sense, outperforms the others because it uh, facilitates diffusion at a much earlier uh, fraction of committed minority. When we went into it a bit further, we found that clustering in particular, so how clustered the network was, um, the higher the clustering, the more likely it was um, to observe diffusion in the simulation. But quite interestingly, um, it slowed down the rate of diffusion. So although you could see diffusion in the simulation, instead of this very sharp explosive transition, it became much more smooth and gradual. Next, uh, we asked, well, where can we put the committed minority to again um, improve our chances of um, observing diffusion? Here we adopted a centrality-based approach, and then we, uh, after we ranked the nodes on their network centrality measures, uh, we placed all the committed minority in the highest um, uh, centrality locations. The question, of course, is which centrality measure, because there's all sorts of different ones that we can draw upon. Um, we tested degree, eigenvector, closeness, between us, and uh, Bonacic centrality. And for the Bonacic uh, centrality, there's a positive uh, attenuation factor and negative attenuation factor. Again, uh, let me just try and summarize uh, what we observed. Different centrality measures would sometimes perform better or worse depending on the particular class of the network. But what was always consistent was that the Bonacic centrality with negative attenuation was most effective, generally speaking, across all the different network classes. And uh, the way that we can understand Bonacic centrality with neg negative attenuation is that, roughly speaking, it, um, nodes have high centrality if they're attached to other isolated nodes. So in this uh, toy example, uh, node one has a very high Bonacic centrality because it's attached to node two, and node two only has uh, two neighbors. So in a sense, it's isolated. Whereas node five has actually a very low centrality because it's attached to node four, and node four has many other neighbors that could influence it. So the finding here is you would want to place committed minority, not necessarily in the hubs or in the highest degree um, positions, but you want to position them so that they're the only ones influencing isolated nodes. So in, in a sense, it's a little bit counterintuitive perhaps, but um, I guess uh, when you think about it a bit more, then there is some, um, I guess, method behind this madness. Uh, next, we looked at the this uh, relative advantage and dynamic norms. Um, uh, idea and for all of the previous um, results we relied on numerical simulations but here we decided we wanted some more theoretical and quantitative um, analysis so we simplified the model and then we uh, and this allowed for some more tractable um, analysis and the derivation of explicit quantitative results so what we did was to say well now we're going to assume that every agent um, at each time has a probability gamma of uh, being influenced by dynamic norms. And so what happens here is um, if we let Z be the fraction of people that have adopted the innovation at this particular time uh, step, then an agent that's influenced by dynamic norms selects the innovation if the innovation's increased in popularity over the previous time step. They're going to go back to the status quo if the innovation has decreased in popularity over the previous time step. It doesn't matter how, like how many people are selecting this, as long as the trend is in a particular direction, they're going to go with the trend. If there's no trend, they'll just 
stay, stay still. And so every agent has a probability gamma that this happens to them at any uh, particular time. Otherwise, they're just going to um, coordinate and play this coordination game I talked about at the start. Um, but again, uh, actually, to be honest, to, for the purposes of ensuring uh, we could get theoretical results, we changed how the network structure was formed. Previously, there was a sort of static network structure. And here, um, what we instead said was, at each time t, agents will reach out randomly into the population um, and form k different contacts, where k is at least 2. Then they're going to um, play a coordination game against each of these k contacts using the myopic best response rule I talked about. So what happens is, at every time all these agents reach out, grab contacts, play coordination games, and then remove the links. So you've got a time varying network. And in the literature, this is called uh, an activity driven network. And of course, we've got an innovation strategy that has a relative uh, advantage of alpha. Um, for those that are interested in the theoretical approach, the, the biggest challenge here was that it wasn't a Markov process. So you couldn't um, initially apply these tools, but there was a sort of clever way of expanding the state space um, in order to turn it into a Markov process. And then we could apply the usual um, uh, analytical techniques. So what we considered was the fact that at time t, uh, at, at zero time, we have a consensus status quo. Everyone selects the zero strategy. And then at time one, there's a fraction of innovators who I'll denote by zeta that adopt the innovation. And the model has four parameters um, that define its dynamics. Um, K, the number of contacts, alpha, the relative advantage, uh, gamma, this probability of being influenced by dynamic norms, and zeta is the fraction of innovators. Um, we say that the quadruple of parameters will guarantee social diffusion if the fraction of innovation adopters approaches one minus epsilon with high probability. It will maintain the st status quo if zeta instead approaches epsilon with high probability, where epsilon is a small positive constant, and with high probability means that the probability of observing this event approaches one polynomially as the number of agents uh, tends to infinity. So we're trying to understand what happens uh, in the limit of large scale populations. Um, so again, this sort of uh, more mathematical representations of the results, but here's the, uh, the summary of what we found. And a, as a reminder, these are the four parameters of interest. So if, there are no dynamic norms, then diffusion will occur if the relative advantage is sufficiently large with respect to k, which is the number of contacts. So if you've got k equals three, then if alpha is uh, sufficiently large, I think in this case, alpha has to be larger than one, um, then you will get diffusion with high probability. Um, if k isn't large, enough, sorry, if alpha isn't large enough with respect to k, then what you would need is that the fraction of uh, innovators at the start of the process has to cross a threshold. And this threshold can be explicitly computed as a function of um, K and alpha. So either you need a really large advantage or you need enough adopters at the start to kickstart the process, so to speak. On the other hand, if you introduce this dynamic norms component, diffusion is guaranteed if gamma is sufficiently large. Um, and if gamma is positive but not large enough, then diffusion occurs if you've got enough uh, innovators. And zeta star, so this um, critical threshold of innovators, is a monotonically decreasing function of gamma. The take home message here is that um, sensitivity to dynamic norms helps to facilitate an, uh, social diffusion either by guaranteeing that diffusion occurs outright or by lowering the number of innovators that you would require. Okay, so in the last uh, five or so minutes, let me just go through the um, co-evolutionary model. Here, our interest uh, began by making the observation that a person's opinion towards a particular issue or topic um, does not always, but it can, but does not always predict uh, behavior or action. So I might be very much against the COVID-19 vaccine, but for whatever number of reasons, I might still actually take it. 
And in particular, I was quite fascinated by this idea of unpopular norms that people uh, not only obey, but enforce onto others, even though privately everyone hates it. Um, there's also a concept of pluralistic ignorance, which I found quite um, fascinating. And so we set out to develop a model where opinions and actions could co-evolve um, mutually influencing one another. Uh, what I want to point out is that there's a very large body of literature on opinion formation processes under social influence. In fact, as Yoshi mentioned, this is what I worked on for my PhD. Uh, I'll talk about just one model, which is the Fredkin Johnson model. And so for these agents in this population, instead of having a binary strategy XI, you now have um, an opinion YI, which is a real valued number. And the opinion updates according to this equation. So WIJ is a non-negative influence weight of the opinion of agent J on agent I, and we enforce this particular constraint. What that tells us is this summation term here is a convex combination of the opinions of uh, the neighboring agents. Gamma is um, a parameter from zero to one that captures ag the agent's attachment to the initial opinion. So when gamma is zero, this term disappears. And what you have is the opinion at the next time step is a perfect convex combination of all your neighboring opinions. And as gamma tends towards one, this term dominates and you become more and more attached to your initial opinion. So you're more stubborn, so to speak. We've got a model for uh, yeah, the decision-making um, um, uh, as a game theoretic formulation. And as it turns out, many opinion dynamics models can also be formulated as best response uh, to a game. So this is the Friedkin Johnson model I just talked about. Um, it's actually a, a game where you've got a payoff function of a particular quadratic form. And the opinion at the next time step is the myopic best response to some uh, payoff function. So um, it's not really important to know the details of this, but the point here is we've got another game uh, at hand. So what we did was say, well, let's imagine every agent has a binary action, uh, minus one or one. So I've changed it from zero because of uh, symmetry purposes, no other reason. And we've got an opinion value from minus one to one. So you can think of an opinion minus one as this agent really prefers the action minus one in opinion of one as this, uh, this agent really prefers the action one. And then the magnitude of Y might be the strength of your pre preference. Y being zero is uh, a neutral agent. We provide a single payoff function for the agent um, selecting their action and their strategy. This action payoff is nothing but that coordination game I talked about um, right at the start. We've got that opinion payoff I just showed in the previous slide. And then there's a term that we've added to couple the two uh, dynamics together. And you can think of this as the agent trying to resolve a discrepancy between what they prefer and what they're doing. Um, these A, B, and C are just coefficients, again, telling you how much do they care about which particular part of the process. Um, and then we say, well, the agents will update their action and their um, opinion as a best response to the overall payoff function. There's some uh, mathematics involved, but what it turns out is that the actions are still selected based on that standard coordination approach. But now, if the agent has a very strong preference for something, they're much more likely to um, adopt that action, even if uh, all their neighbors are doing the opposite, let's say. And the opinions are updated according to the standard Friedkin Johnson model. But now there's also an influence from the agent's own action. So the first result we got was a theoretical one. Um, regardless of how you initialize this agent population, the actions and opinions of all agents will converge to an equilibrium, um, which, is an asymptote, which is the Nash equilibrium of the game. And the actions converge, in fact, in a finite number of time steps, while the uh, opinions converge asymptotically. And this uh, approach relies on uh, ordinal potential games, uh, but there was a particular challenge involved. So let me talk about polarization as, as an outcome of this particular model. Um, the network, we can say, is polarized if the agents can be split into two groups, where one group selects an action and um, has a preference for it, and the other group selects the opposite action and has a preference um, for this opposite action. Uh, 
The way to read this particular um, network is the inner circle denotes the action, blue for minus one, red for plus one. The outer circle denotes their opinion, um, again, red for uh, positive Y and blue for uh, negative Y. And the strength of the color denotes its intensity. So you can see some people have um, got an action and an opinion that's opposite. So I've just arbitrarily sampled uh, these from a random distribution. And um, I'll uh, yeah, quickly uh, run through this. Um, but what you see is that over time, even though initially it was a very homogenous spread, uh, polarization emerges. And uh, this, well, this one's very stubborn, but um, eventually they switch and uh, it will continue running, but uh, they will just converge to a polarized equilibrium. Okay, so um, to conclude, hopefully I've uh, introduced to you the idea of using agent-based models, using um, game theory and coordination to study collective behavior. The first thing we did was to run some experiments and look at or identify other psychological mechanisms that might um, be at play and that we need to include in the model. Uh, I've used a, a range of simulations and theory to explore different factors that could facilitate innovation diffusion. And lastly, we looked at how um, actions and opinions can co-evolve and how to model this. In terms of current and future work, there's uh, a lot um, to explore and not enough time. Um, we're interested in applying our modeling framework to existing data sets, but there are challenges associated with that. We want to examine the social context and other potential biases and uh, decision making. So would it matter if people sat in a room and played that game? Uh, would it matter if your strategy was explicitly associated with your choice uh, as opposed to being anonymous? Um, would it matter if we ran the same experiment in tight versus loose cultures? And although I've touched a bit on it, I'm really interested in influence and control. So coming from a control engineering background, um, we could have open loop control where you come up with a strategy at the start, you set it and you let it run on forever. Or uh, recently, I'm quite interested in closed loop feedback control where you dynamically and adaptively adjust your uh, control approach in order to um, efficiently achieve your objective. So thanks uh, for paying attention for the whole thing. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions now or you know, throughout this week, I'm more than happy to uh, have a chat. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, any questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, Josh, did you say I could go ahead or not? Sorry, Piers, we've got one here for now and then we can get to you afterwards, that's all right. That's fine. All right, I guess I'll start off. Okay, so well, thank you so much for the presentation. Great overview of like a lot of work. Um, I think I been my question relates a little bit to the last thing you said more on the um, uh, control aspect of it yep. um because you sort of answered already sort of what is the most optimal way or to play sort of these sort of minority bots and in a sense as well like how many needs or the minimum amount to needs but since you got a um, um, sort of a time varying network anyways have you guys thought about or looked at um if you could change the strategy over time is there like a more optimal setting should you just place them all at once should you change them um, over time, or say it was a Russian hacker, what is my optimal strategy mm. for influence elections? Yeah, uh, yeah. so I think time varying strategies are uh, very much in flavor. Um, what we initially started off doing was, a, in a sense, a naive approach. So what happens if we put the committed minority in gradually? So, you know, like maybe create, try to create a trend art artificially with these committed minority. Turns out it didn't actually do much, uh, but that could be just because we did a very naive approach as a test. Um, so maybe there's a much more, um, I guess, uh, intelligent way to use this time varying um, approach to inject, let's say influence at certain points in time. Um, the other thing is, as I pointed out here, um, what you could also do is um, increase the um, incentives over time um, and maybe for specific agents in particular. So that would be like, you know, providing maybe subsidies right at the start uh, when you want to spread new EVs. And then later on, you might say, okay, well, it's sort of taking off by itself. I can now reduce those subsidies and we'll still be able to achieve diffusion and you save the government some money. So 
um, I think time varying approaches are very much um, important to explore in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've got a question from Piers. Piers, do you want to chime in now? Uh, yes, please. And can you hear me, Sasha? Sorry, what was that? Sorry, I'm just checking. Can you hear me? So I'm guessing not. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Oh, perfect. That's good. Um, that, that was that was a, um, a fascinating um, talk then. I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the last bit about the polarization because one of the things is um, we've discovered is it's very hard to polarize people, a group of people in a lab setting. And yet you were getting that polarization occurring, um, it seemed, quite easily. And I was wondering what the differences were, why you were getting it so easily com compared to a, a conventional um, lab setting. And was it this action term, the fact that people were um, wanting to take an action that benefited them? Um, could, you, could you explain, this is a tough question, but could you explain what do you need to do to ensure that people polarize? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I, the first thing is, yes, I think the action term um, plays a very strong role. And um, in particular, so what I didn't talk about is the fact that um, you can actually derive some um, sufficient conditions on these parameters for polarization. And one of the things you would really need is people to be extremely consistent with between their opinion and their actions. So if that particular parameter in the model is very high, um, you're much more likely to observe polarization. The other thing is, in a sense, um, I, uh, this particular example was for, the, for demonstrative purposes. So what I did was create, let's say, the optimal um, conditions for polarization by having two very, very strongly connected in-groups, let's say, and very sparse connections between um, the two camps. And so from the combination of this strong desire to be consistent um, and the fact that you have these two camps, uh, polarization can emerge. But at the same time, if I ran the simulation several times, you could also see consensus on all red or all blue. So it's not a um, it's not a predetermined outcome, let's say. It can depend on which particular agent updates in which order. Um, and so there are theoretical conditions that guarantee polarization, um, but you have to start in a polarized state and then you'll converge or stay within this polarized state. If you have a sort of more homogeneous mix at the start, it's a far more complex and open question, I think. Thank you very much. All right, uh, but it's this this model is not really clear, clear like what is the coupling between opinion and action yeah um, mm -hmm. and when you define polarization is it polarization in terms of actions or polarization in terms of opinions yeah. so this more clarification if you can get yeah, yeah. so in terms of the coupling um, it comes from this last term here. And um, if you want to try and uh, uh, maybe interpret it intuitively, what this uh, coupling term means is that the agent um, gets a higher payoff if their action and their opinions are aligned. So if, if YI is, in fact, this term is, um, or, although maybe this should be a negative because then uh, this will decrease, but, um, so this term is, uh, you get the highest payoff if your action is, or sorry, if your opinion is minus one or plus one, um, depending on whether your action is minus one or plus one. So that's the, um, that's how the, uh, the two are coupled. And when it comes to the polarization, um, I've defined it as when uh, there are two groups where in one group, the actions and opinions are all red, let's say. And then in the other group, the actions and opinions are all blue. So uh, because there is there are both actions and opinions of said polarization means that um, each person is aligned um, with their particular group in both their action and their opinion. In, in some cases, but in some cases, hello. So in, in some cases, maybe you cannot change your actions, like you you already had the COVID vaccine, right? But your opinion 
and it's still extremely rich. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, I guess in our model, we allow for constantly changing actions. So maybe the, the vaccine example, uh, I mean, we can take boosters now. So, <laughs> so in a sense, um, you know, uh, it, it, so if it was something that you had, you could only do once, like install solar panels, um, this model is probably not 100% appropriate for it. Um, it's maybe appropriate for something where you can um, switch between actions. So yeah, maybe instead it, it's better for like handshake versus polar uh, versus elbow bump, and you know, maybe there's polarization in that. We have one question from Gary. Gary, do you want to chime in? Then we might call it there afterwards. So was that a summons to me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, ben, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, if, if you've spent time in Groningen, doubtless you would have become aware of uh, Tom Schneider's stochastic actor oriented model, which uh, covers co evolution of both networks and uh, opinions. Um, I was wondering how that particular model might relate to or be integrated with your own work. Um, sorry, so what was the model called? Stochastic? The stochastic act oriented model of uh, Tom Schneider's. Yeah, so um, so I'll be honest, I don't actually, I'm not familiar with that model. So it might be okay. better for me to actually do some reading um, offline and sure. maybe I can provide sure. an answer after. In um, some ways, it's an outgrowth of Fried, Friedkin and Johnson, but considerably advanced. Um, yep, thank you. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just for Gary, I think it's the same as an activity-driven network of my understanding. Okay. We just call it differently coming from engineering versus psychology. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I definitely will um, read up on it and then, yeah. Yeah, so I think you're already using that model, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there are some, probably some subtle differences. It would be interesting to understand I mean, in some sense the last part of the work the last part of the work that you described ben there's some similarity there but um i suspect in the actual implementation there are considerable nuances that might be worth thinking about okay yeah i'll definitely yeah anyway it's a so it's an issue for further discussion you might find it interesting yeah perfect Yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Yep. Yeah, okay. It seems like okay. Well, thank you again. So this will be the end of the seminar. And uh, uh, if uh, you're interested in talking to him, uh, he'll be around for the next um, a week or so. So please be in touch. So yeah. Well, thanks for your attendance. All right. See ya. <laughs>